story starts in 2008. Uh, Lehman Brothers, my, my former employer, uh, filed for bankruptcy. I think it was the largest bankruptcy in the history of the world. Before that time, and when I worked at Lehman, periodically people would tell me that I looked like Dick Fold, and I, I thought that was pretty cool, especially when I was rising up in the ranks. I don't find that amusing anymore. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the stock price there. So the story really starts before the bankruptcy filing, in the years leading up. Uh, and at the time they filed for bankruptcy, Lehman had almost a million derivative transactions outstanding. And that was uh, spread out through 6,000 is the master agreements. And Gary talked about about his master agreements. But those are basic agreements that dictate the trading relationship between a bank and its clients. So about 6,000 trading agreements, a million contracts. It's eight years later, Many of those million contracts are still outstanding. However, the futures contracts that they had outstanding, the clear derivatives transactions that they had outstanding were resolved in a matter of days and weeks. So pretty big, pretty big dichotomy. Just for the sake of full disclosure, I was responsible for probably uh, eight of those transactions. The other 999,000 were, were not fault. So what happened? Uh, we talked a lot about uh, regulation here. Uh, on Thursday will be the sixth anniversary of the Dodd-Frank Act. I'm guessing Gary is hosting a Dodd-Frank anniversary party at his house. I guess I haven't been invited. Uh, there's Dodd, there's Frank, and uh, that's a pretty meaty law that was passed. I think it was about 2,200 pages, and you would think in 2,200 pages there'd be a lot of detail spelled out, and there was, but there was also a lot of detail that wasn't spelled out, and they left it to the regulators to fill in all the blanks, roll out the rules, and then let the market react. Six years later, they're not done with that part of the job. And that's part of why some of these very interesting commercial opportunities like Paris Exchange take a long time. And so you can think about this as a case study. This happens to be my job in my life, so it's much more important, and I hope it has a happy ending. But think of this like a little business school a case study here. So a lot of a lot of different areas of Dodd-Frank to, to learn about or to ignore. Uh, one area is Title VII talks about derivatives trading, and within that section, there's a rule set out about clearing of swap transactions. So I'm um, glossing over 98% of the detail, but, but think of it this way. Before 2012, you were able to trade contracts bilaterally. That's what the is the master agreements were about in most of those million transactions. A bank faces its client, and there isn't much credit support or collateral, and you hope that both parties are around for the life of the transaction, and the, the deal that you signed up for actually occurs as you had planned. Dodd-Frank basically makes most of that bilateral trading illegal, and inserts clearing houses right in the middle of the parties to the trade. And so that risk that was pointing in all different directions is now centralized. And there's also collateral that's required. So, most of the market, many people in the market would say, wow, that's a real big change that occurred. But I think a lot of folks would also say it's done pretty well. There are definitely debates around whether or not the risk has been reduced in the market by getting rid of all these bilateral transactions and eliminating the impact of another Lehman. But at the same time, maybe you have more risk because you're centralizing the risk amongst a few counterparties. So we can separately have that debate. The, the, the part that's not debatable is this is a big, big change that's, that has occurred. And, um, and why do we focus on this out of the 2,200 pages? Well, it's because of this. This is a really, really big market, 400 trillion notional outstanding. And that's why you see so much discussion on this topic, and that's why you see companies like Eris focus on this type of, this type of opportunity. So what is Eris? It depends what your perspective is. If you're into Greek mythology, you know Eris is the goddess of strife and discord. If you're into astronomy, you know Eris, uh, Eris is the largest dwarf planet, which Started in 2005, and if you're into derivatives and financial services, you know Eris is the largest dwarf exchange based in Chicago and New York. So we are a new futures exchange. We're the first futures exchange that was uh, certified by the CFTC following the um, following the credit crisis, following the, the passage of uh, Dodd Frank. And we'll talk a little bit about what we do and, and what we uh, what we focus on. So we did the history lesson. Let's talk a little bit about geography. So this is the simplified view of the United States and financial services. New York has traditionally been known for banks, bilateral derivative trades, large institutions, swaps, credit default swaps, interest rate swaps, things of that nature. 
Chicago is generally known for futures, clear products, proprietary trading firms. And in essence, what's happened is the regulations have really pushed a lot of the swap business, which is traditionally been called New York's OTC, to look more like the futures markets. And so what you see at Eris Exchange is our product is essentially a hybrid of swaps and futures. It's a swap-like product that lives in the world of futures. And our company is a hybrid. Half the company's in Chicago, half the company is, is sitting in New York. Maybe, maybe we should have set up shop in like Youngstown, Ohio, or something like right in the front of the middle there. But we're, uh, we're, we're in both just like the market. This, this is really uh, how we, we tend to think about what, you know, what, what regulation is driving the market to become. And so where did this thing come from? What is it? 2010, as Dodd Frank was being written, uh, a couple of folks, the Chicago based, more futures oriented, who were sitting around saying, hey, we're very, very active in the futures markets. We provide liquidity to the futures markets. We're customers of the futures markets. We trade cash treasuries. We trade all these interest rate products. We represent a huge uh, percentage of the activity. Yet you've got this New York centric swap market, which is controlled by the banks, and we can't really, we can get in there as customers, but we can't really get in there as liquidity providers. You know, this Dodd-Frank thing is really leveling the playing field. And let's figure out what can we do commercially to take advantage of that. So, Neil, CEO, um, one of our founding members, and if you've ever heard of DRW Trading, he's the D, the R, and the W, basically got together and said, hey, why don't we design a futures contract that replicates OTC? And the reason you do that is because most of these regulations that we're talking about really are pointed towards the OTC market, changing the OTC market, making it more like futures. And then the futures market is just sitting over here saying, hey, we've been around for hundreds of years. We work fine. The rules are not really impacting us. Why don't you work, operate more into this market structure? So design the product. It gives firms like DRW and Citadel and Knight and all these big proprietary, proprietary trading firms, the ability to be liquidity providers, customers, et cetera. It replicates OTC derivatives, it's lower cost, it's operationally simple, it meets all the requirements. Great, sounds like we have a great product. This thing should really take off. And I think it will, but the reality is these things take a long time, partially because what we talked about, the rules take a long time to get rolled out. But we're also dealing with a market where Firms and individuals and traders are used to trading certain products in certain ways, and they've been doing it for 10 or 20 or 30 years. So your best case scenario is you have an amazing product and it takes a really long time to head in the right direction. We don't have to talk about the other scenario. The, uh, the other thing to note is you can't do this alone, and just having that perfect product isn't sufficient. And so for us, the story has been <clears throat> partnering with key market participants along the way. So when we started, we, uh, we're an exchange, we have a product, but it clears at the CME. We've never gotten one of those bags, one of them, though, by the way, but we have a partnership with those guys. We were founded. We partnered with State Street, which provides our technology, our trading matching engine technology. Fidelity came in as an early investor, you know, representing the buy side and seeing the market structure change and wanting to be a part of that and wanting to have a voice in that. Morgan Stanley joined us in early 2013 as an investor in the company, sit on the board of directors, the also liquidity providers on the platform. Uh, and then with our, uh, our patent, our intellectual property that, that Doug mentioned, we were able to license to our friends in Canada, who in September will be launching Canadian dollar denominated contracts that look exactly like our US dollar denominated contracts. Um, Society General joined us last year, like Morgan Stanley, as an investor and as a liquidity provider. We've licensed our product to ICE, who uh, has our Euro and Sterling product listed, and then has also taken our interest rate product and moved it over to the credit market, and there's now credit default swaps based on the Eris intellectual property. Uh, and then a couple weeks ago, uh, the CDOE uh, invested in Eris and joined the, um, and joined the board of directors. So a lot of what we do to try and build this thing is the basic blocking and tackling of getting out to traders and selling the, the product and the benefits and helping people get onboarded. But a lot of what you have to do to get these things going is find supportive market participants. And when you represent, represent strife and discord, it's not necessarily so easy to do. So we're five, six years into this thing. You know, we've got 
uh, very noteworthy corners here, but this is not like the graph we saw earlier with thousands of things along a timeline. This is you know five or six meaningful things, and I think this is probably representative of what a lot of successful ventures have looked like over time. You know, you really have to focus on the strategic as well as the tactical, but know that it's not going to move terribly fast. And I think I can say that with confidence, it's not just Eris is taking a long time. If you look at the most successful futures products in the market, the story is always the same. When you think of euro dollars or you think of VIX, both very heavily traded, very mature products at this point, you know, it, it's very easy to forget that they all started like Eris at the, at the zero level, and they all had very, very long incubation periods, and at some point they start to go vertical. The challenge is you don't know when and you don't know why, and you can't predict it ahead of time. So you have to keep keep working at it until until it happens. We think we are somewhere around here, maybe, but we don't we don't know. We'll come back and tell you if that's true or not. So with that, uh, other than just establishing that we're about to dominate the whole planet in all asset classes, I think I'll uh, I think I'll stop there.